Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Chit Heads. My guest today is Tias Little. Tias is committed to teaching yoga as a contemplative path, leading to greater sensitivity, tolerance, and deeper understanding. His approach to the practice is interdisciplinary, passionate, intelligent, innovative, and full of insight. Tias synthesizes years of study in classical yoga, Sanskrit, Buddhist studies, anatomy, massage, and trauma healing. Tias began studying the work of B.K.S. Iyengar in 1984 and lived in Mysore, India in 1989, studying Ashtanga Vinyasa Yoga with Patabi Joyce. Tias is a licensed massage therapist, and his somatic studies include in-depth training and cranial sacral therapy. His practice and teaching is influenced by the work of Ida Rolf, Feldenkrais, and Thomas Hanna. Tias is a longtime student of the meditative arts and Buddhist studies, beginning with Vipassana and continuing in Tibetan Buddhism and Zen. He earned a master's degree in Eastern philosophy from St. John's College in Santa Fe, New Mexico in 1998. Tias also lives in Santa Fe, where he directs his school Prajna Yoga with his wife Surya and is the author of three books, The Thread of Breath, Meditations on a Dewdrop, and Yoga of the Subtle Body. In addition to leading yoga workshops and teacher trainings throughout the U.S. and around the world, Tias currently offers online classes through Yoga Glow. So hello, Tias. Thanks so much for joining me. Hi, Jacob. It's a joy to be with you. Um, it's a real pleasure to get an opportunity to chat with you. Um, you are honestly one of my favorite yoga teachers, so it's always a pleasure and, uh, and, uh, and often a, uh, a battle with a little bit of anxiety and starstruckness, so <laughs> hopefully it won't come off too, too much. But um, So to start off, I'd love to hear a little bit about your story, and you know, we've heard a little bit about your story in the, in the bio here, but I'd love to hear from your perspective you know, how you came to yoga. Yoga and, and really what were sort of the significant moments for you along that uh, trajectory? Well, let's see. Yeah, like I've been practicing yoga since the 16th century, starting in North India. And, uh, uh, <laughs> um, you know, I, I came, I've come to this practice, um, I think just really through, you know, this, this kind of great passion to resolve the fundamental split you know this split inside of myself that i felt you know just really acutely as a as an adolescent and and in my college years and and uh um and and you know worked through a lot of pain um in my own subtle body and my my heart pain and um and 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 so you know i think the the, the aim of yoga is to to work with this fundamental split you know yoga is about about healing the split, and um, um, my mother was a counselor, so I kind of come through, through, um, through her 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 background, and also, um, yeah, I started in the Iyengar training uh, um, initially, um, but then I'm I'm a really interdisciplinary guy. I like to bring a lot of different threads and tie them onto my spool. Um, mm. You know, um, some of the Taoist practices or Zen practices, and and um uh, buddhist uh, uh training and 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 uh somatic understanding mm. yeah yeah mm. that's excellent so you know it's interesting that you remarked on you know healing the split which i think is sort of um uh, a good point to kind of segue into our discussion of the subtle body since a lot of this splitting manifests in experiences of the subtle body and and you wrote this beautiful book yoga of the subtle body which i thought was particularly interesting because you know it really did do a very good job at um integrating your very precise and deep knowledge of anatomy of, of anatomy and the wisdom of the subtle body and also you know engaging in, in the beautiful kind of metaphoric language that poetic metaphoric language that you're very skilled at um and that's sort of an, that's those are really two interesting worlds to straddle it's like you're healing the split of this sort of western linear linear approach with this sort of like wise holistic approach so even in even in that text itself it's sort of like uh, an exercise in in this um um bridging the split uh, or bridging the divide as you were mentioning and so you know i'm curious to hear maybe a little bit about your thoughts on you know, we often see uh, Western anatomy invoked in a way that doesn't 
jive with subtle body and oftentimes those who are interested in anatomy are sort of um, speak poorly of the subtle body or think it's sort of a backwards modality because it doesn't remark on anything physical in, in, in that sort of traditional sense. So um, just your reflections on, you know, the apparent separation or the apparent difference of, of these two traditions and, and how you see in them as being complementary. Mm. Well, you know, I think that the um, ancient seers, you know, S-E-E-R-S, you know, the rishis that, that really, you know, downloaded the Vedas uh, through divine inspiration, you know, they were really able to, 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 to tap into, um, you know, the, the internal states of, of awareness through meditation, obviously, and through prayer and through, you know, uh, watching lightning flash in, in the in the sky and through a summer cloud and and so really um i think this these these um that yoga kind of comes out of um these inner visions and uh and so um i think the more you know that today that we can work with um our our inner or you know our our, our in, inner perceptions our inner capacity to to see um, the, the more we're, we're, we practice yoga. And so, you know, the, the, the word mm, interoception is used in some of the uh, uh, ter terminology in the counseling world or the world of neuroscience today, the, that capacity to perceive inwardly what's happening. And um, in the history of, you know, Tantra or whether it's Buddhist Tantra or Yoga Tantra would, would you know, imagine a demon or imagine a, a, a bird or imagine a you know um a, a cloud and and so so through the imaginary realm what's called the sham the sambhogakaya in the in the mahayana teachings this this kind of you know dreamlike world um we 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 can really uh uh begin to to work in the subtle body that is how thoughts affect feelings and how states of consciousness affect our our glandular secretions and our respiratory mm. rhythms. And so just, you know, riding the subway or riding in on the elevator or being in conversation with your spouse in the kitchen before a dinner, you know, can, can really trigger all kinds of, just really a myriad number of feelings inside. So, you know, my process, my yoga now is, is a kind of attunement to that inner realm of, um, of sense and feeling and, uh, and then, and then, and then the ancients sort of mapped it out with these elaborate, you know, uh, charts. A little bit like the inside of your your cell phone that has all this circuitry and panels and you know uh, um, uh, 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 conduits. That really the map of the chakras or the map of the vayus or the koshas, these various you know subtle energies were mapped out, and and so. Um, uh, uh, it's really interesting to me the, to compare and contrast some of these ancient blueprints, um, these ancient circuit boards that were mapped out going back, you know, um, 500, 800, 900 years ago with um, what we know today in contemporary research on, on um, neuroscience and, you know, um, the, the hormonal system and, um, and, and this kind of thing. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, what I, what I like about it is that you don't seem to, you know, the, it's not about reducing one or the one to the other. It's not about reducing the subtle body to anatomy or reducing anatomy to the subtle body, but really uh, illustrating the ways in which they enrich each other. Do you want to um, maybe take us on, you know, a short journey, an abridged journey up the chakras um, and, and sort of touching on maybe a little bit of the subtle and how the subtle meets the anatomical sort of, um, uh, and I know that we could go on for hours on this topic, but maybe just a, a shorter uh, abridged version. Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, maybe, uh kind of parallel to the chakras is, is in the subtle body map, you know, there's the, there's the muscular skeletal system. So a lot of people do yoga from the muscular skeletal system. That is, you know, they're doing warrior one and they're lunging forward and stepping back and lowering down into, you know, the chaturanga, you know, the push-up position. And it's very, 
you know, muscular. And then, and then the next, you know, after doing that for 10 years and surviving it without, uh, you know, tweaking a shoulder or throwing a sacrum out, then the next, you know, kind of strata or layer of practice, at least in my experience, is then, then working kind of, you know, in the, in the prana, of course, or the, mm-hmm. the breathing. And then there's the viscera, you know, of like, gee, how does my practice support my kidneys and my, you know, um, liver and my bloodstream. And, and then there's the layer of the, of the, of the, uh, the glands, the, you know, that is um, our, our hormonal system governed by the adrenals and, and the master glands in the neck and the head, the thyroid pituitary that govern metabolic function, you know, Mm. um, govern, you know, how fast we hum and how much life force we have. And, and so then there's this kind of way we started tuning to our interior um, and then it goes further into kind of a spinal shaft awareness where um, over time primarily of course through sitting practice that we start to attune to spinal rhythms and and the pulsatory rhythms in our spinal cord and brain stem and and the and the hemispheres of the brain itself and so that's kind of like you know this apple where we start on the skin and the outer shiny layer and then we go through the flesh and in towards the the center of the of the apple and the, where the seeds are and the and um the kind of the wisdom lies you know in the hatha yoga the the wisdom seeds are planted in deep in the interior so um that's maybe kind of a simple rendering of the of the, this, this movement into the subtle body. But, you know, for instance, my own practice now, I don't crank myself as I used to, you know, kind of before I knew better, it was like, you know, it was a very calisthenic yoga that I did. And yeah. was, the, the edge had to be extreme. And now the edge that I ride can be as, as, as light as a dragonfly wing or as, as subtle as, you know, um, as, as just the, 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 the slightest of breezes. Uh, and so, so really the edge can be anywhere as, uh, when, when, when I'm doing a posture or, or I'm, I'm certainly in a sitting uh, meditation. And, and so, um, but I didn't understand that in the beginning. I thought that more was better and, and, um, and there was a, a kind of urgency I felt to have to, you know, to push for, further and farther. Um, and when that dropped away for me, uh, when I kind of reconciled my pusher, that's when my whole subtle body just really, you know, there's just acres and acres opened up to me. Um, mm. uh, and that's, that, that's, it was a beautiful transition in, in my own personal practice. So I really like the way you expressed, you know, when I invited you to reflect on this sort of path towards subtler layers, you know, you were, it was sort of a, the way you described it was a path from the growths to the subtle exterior to in interior. And, and I think, you know, a lot of people, when they discuss the subtle body, it's usually around this kind of traditional path of the Kundalini at the base of the spine, rising up the channels and, 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 you know, breaking the obstructions of karma along the way. So what is that? Um, do you see the subtle body in that, traditional way as well as sort of an ascending energy or do you see it a a little bit differently and then how does that relate then to this kind of like from gross to subtle exterior to internal layers kind of um uh topology well that's a good question i mean really you know the whole of it idea of ascension is not uh you know, limited to the yogic view of the Kundalini. I mean, the whole ascension, the notion of ascension in the in the Christian mystical tradition is is has a very similar idea. Um, yeah. And even the crucifixion of the cross, uh, Christ on the cross on the top of the Calvaria of the hill, you know, is 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 a kind of ascension. And so, but really, you know, I guess I, I took more of a view that the life force, it's called the anima, you know, in the Jungian tradition, that anima, that, that deep life force, it, 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 it moves everywhere. It not only moves upward, but moves downwards, moves sidewards, moves inwards, moves outwards, um, moves backward in time, forward in time. It's kind of, it's, it's no longer really time bound, of course. Mm-hmm. It's certainly not bound by our tissues. 
meaning you know the limits of our you know our um our, our hamstrings and our, <laughs> and our trapezius it, it's not bound by our body uh, um and, and so really that the nature of the chitta the nature of consciousness of course is boundless uh and that's espoused in most all i think of the meditative traditions of of india china and japan and and Tibet, you know, it's really that it's it, it's boundless, and so um, then it's yeah, it's not simply about moving upward. In yeah. fact, a lot of my practices is um, there's a lot of dropping, you know, there's a lot of sinking, there's a lot of dropping, and that's a good antidote to um, you know what I call um, the, uh, uh, the, the sort of um, in the French coffee press. You know when you you got all those swirls, yeah. You know, it, it, it just like all the flakes of prana just swirling up there. It's really great to do the French coffee press of sinking, <laughs> and settling. You know, so that so so your um, so your morning brew is clear. Mm, I love a more a clear morning brew. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, you know, maybe I was going to talk ask you about this in a in later, but I feel like maybe it's an appropriate time because you know the ascension we're talking about. You know, it's not just about ascension, but that ascending maybe sometimes gets attached to a, a kind of traditional view of the spiritual path as sort of an up and out, you know, transcending the body, you know, moving to higher states of consciousness that are sort of, you know, above this sort of brute, you know, ignorant physical field, or at least that's, you know, how it's couched sometimes. And, you know, par- in, 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 in a talk that I listened to of yours, you mentioned how oftentimes there is a confusion between the the experience of a mature spiritual insight or, or sort of the, the maturation of sadhana, as you actually put it, and the kind of dissociative experiences that might be um, induced by trauma. So do you see this sometimes problematic relationship between trauma-induced disassociation and this kind of, you know, um, uh, this kind of traditional or simplistic idea of ascending out of the body? Sure. I mean, I think it's really common that people get confused. I mean, the yoga high is, you know, palpable. I mean, I've, I've, um, you know, self uh, sedate, you know, been, done a lot of self sedation where I use the practice to, you know, to really just kind of mute my, Mm-hmm. and mellow myself right out and you know, really super floaty and um and and that that feels good there's maybe a time for all of us where we identify with the practice that way um uh but you know i think that uh well for one that can be kind of a trap you know, that itself is can it can be a cul-de-sac and can take students you know 10 15 years to sometimes get out of that cul-de-sac um, of the sort of yoga high and yeah um, and, and so really uh, yeah of course the the, the the experience of upward rising you know energy which is really kind of, kind of called udana vayu in the, um, the, 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 the subtle body the five winds one of them goes upward and the whole idea of udiana mula bandha is to kind of move the energy upward it does. It, get, it can get confused with disassociative states of awareness. And I think all in the course of a day, you know, we blip out. We, each of us has our own little strategies for blip asana, you know, just, like, <laughs> you, know, just kind of, you know, just a quick checkout. And maybe we get skillful and we only check out for three and a half seconds. But, you know, more, more, more times than not, we're checking out for longer periods of time. We're not present anymore for what's arising. And, um, and, and really disassociative states where the, the body protects itself from an overwhelming f- uh, threat. Um, literally, you know, people, people go out of their body. So, so really the whole idea in the somatic training is to become more embodied, is to be in the ground, in the dirt, in the, you know, in the gut of, um, of, 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 of um, our tissues. And, um, and, the, and I kind of think the word transcendental, you know, I, I really, I like that word, you know, cause trans 
means across. So mm-hmm. it's transatlantic. Then you're going from London to, I mean, from London to New York or, you know, um, and so trans means kind of horizontal, like, you know, so it's, it's not simply a vertical ascension, but it's really, how can we move, how can our, our awareness um, expand in all directions? And, and maybe that's, you know, really more of the feminine, mm. you know, versus sort of the, the muscular, the phallic, the whole notion of the linga and the upward rising consciousness. Of course, it's tied in historically in Hatha Yoga to, you know, um, a, that, a lot of that impulse but the horizontal, so if transcendental is a kind of horizontal experience of of unity or or um, integration or the transpersonal experience, then yeah, maybe it's not so much, you know, yeah. right, right up into the you know, up the rafters into the top of the head. So especially not quickly, really mm-hmm. not of the school to move the energy up quickly. Um, I have lots of caution around around that. Do, I don't want to like um, criticize any particular tradition, but um, does is is that what often Kundalini experiencers are doing? Is it um, in I I'm, I'm, I haven't taken much Kundalini yoga, but I, it feels like it's sort of built around that kind of um, quick ascending kind of energy cultivation. Mm-hmm. Sure. I think it is, you know, in classical Hatha Yoga, there's that idea of, you know, just, um, uh, you know, taking the, taking the, uh, the speedway, you know, right up through the spine and, you know, but, but these texts were put together long before, you know, the era of, of, of the screen and the, and, and yeah. the, the kinds of anxieties we face daily, even in Shanti Little Santa Fe, I find myself, you know, <laughs> starting to swoon with all of the various tasks that I have to, to, to attend to. And, and so, um, you know, what I practice is I practice, you know, I practice really getting into my bones. So if I'm riding the, the subway or I'm in a car or I'm just in a, in a conversation and I start to feel like I start to kind of go up and out, which sometimes I, I identify as the airbag the airbag asana where to protect <laughs> ourselves, we kind of blow out, you know, um, and we get, and it feels kind of good because it feels like there's space, but that space isn't, doesn't have the clarity that the Tibetans talk about when we, in the, in the, in the, in the meditative training, we're talking about the clear light of bliss or the clear space. So what I do instead of doing like airbag asana is like I I get down into my bones. It's a it's more of a downward movement. Yeah. Settle, and and that's really helpful for me, especially people who are kind of airborne anyway. Mm-hmm. And I have a fair amount of vata. I have a fair amount of air in me, and and people have air in them. They like to use it because it kind of feels like, whoosh, you know, like. You know, here I go. I'm, I'm, you know, flying through my day, and I'm doing flying yogi. Yeah, yeah, the flying yogi, and I'm, I'm high on caffeine, and I'm meeting my friends, and everything's happening. But you know, there's something about really getting down, 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 and then staying in that, in the root, really. Um, so the sky becomes the root, sky becomes the ground, ground becomes the root. You know. Yeah. Yeah, that's really beautiful. And, and, and it sort of um, uh, resonates with something that you had mentioned that you write about in your book at the very beginning, which I loved was the first shape that you mentioned first practice is Shavasana, which you had mentioned in the book that you also do often at the beginning of your classes, which, you know, as we know, is oftentimes uh, a, a pose that's done at the end of class. And I really loved that because it really was a practice of dropping in, of connecting with the floor at your back. And, 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 and so I guess, you know, um, and you sort of touched a little bit on this in terms of our kind of culture of speed. And, and so I'm wondering, you know, obviously we, anybody that knows you knows that you're a fan of slowing down. 
Mm -hmm. um, but can you offer you know some reflections on this culture of speed and why slow practices are are so necessary? I mean, we're already sort of talking about it, but I guess I'm also so interested in sort of maybe reflections on how the body and the nervous system is is becoming sort of hijacked by this activity. Mm -hmm. Good, good, good word. Yeah, hijacked. Really, yeah. I mean, I think as a culture, we do it collectively. There's co this collective urgency towards, you know, doing and, and you know, uh, 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 going through your to-do list in a day, knocking off as many things as you can, sending out as many messages, getting as many friends as possible. <laughs> this, sort of, you know, this sort of like shrapnel style, this just sort of put myself out into the world um, and 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 so shrapnel. That's a good way of th looking at it. <laughs> it's kind of makes it very violent, almost. Uh, it is, you know. Even if there's a good intention with that, it steals from the spirit. It, it corrodes, you know, the subtle body, really. So, gathering practices are are so valuable. Whether you're on the land, just directly sitting underneath a ponderosa. Or, underneath the big oak tree or your or 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 gathering practices that really you know collect our prana and and bring it inward are so valuable and um so yes yeah, speed gets trapped in the tissues speed gets trapped in the diaphragm gets trapped in the in the stomach intestine you know affects digestive rhythms affects neurological rhythms, affects sleep patterns. And, um, and so, you know, the practice is really an antidote to the speed body. So yeah. That's why I, I deem, you know, Shavasana is the most important pose. Mm -hmm. And the Shava, you know, is really a gateway to the subtle body. That is, it's a gateway to Pratyahara. It's a gateway to Yoga Nidra, the yogic sleep. Mm -hmm. which is ironically not about sleep at all, but <laughs> wakefulness and, um, and, and, and as a gateway to the meditative states of yoga. So I oftentimes begin in Shavasana and, um, and there's that, that, inward, that inward gathering. Uh, and so, yeah, I'm always really mindful of my own, you know, when I, when I get, have this accumulative speed that builds up and that I can't kind of, you know, I can't get off the, 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 the mill, you know, I can't get off of the, um, the, the speed cycle that over time, and it, it tends to kind of pinwheel, of course, you know, like when you get stuck in speed, you get stuck in that program, you can't get out of it pinwheels. And, um, and it might even feel good. It feel like a pinwheel, pinwheel asana feels good because it's <laughs> moving. So I mean, something must be happening. But we need to wean ourselves off. I think collectively, you know, this is this is perhaps the, uh, so so hard. You know, even to say it is seems antithetical to to our entire forward momentum of our planet. But if we can wean ourselves a bit off of that speed, um, that's why twenty minutes a day, forty five minutes a day in shamatha or in you know chitta niroda, you know, where there's just stillness and um, that's, that's really healing. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think the, any yoga teacher who's committed to the subtler practices is, is trying to kind of, you know, um, offer or invite students to, you know, engage with meditation because it seems that people are much more, people are much more comfortable moving their body dynamically than they are sitting with their eyes closed or even with their eyes open uh, for 20 minutes at a time. For anybody that's sort of, you know, seeking to cultivate a meditation practice, uh, I, there's so many, um, I don't know, myths about meditation. Um, so maybe you want to touch on those myths and, and offer some, some suggestions or insights into how someone might begin to cultivate a, a sitting practice. Mm. Well, I think it's really great to get up in the morning, take your pee and go right to your cushion. Yeah. And, the, you know, and avoid opening your screen. So once you've opened your screen, you've had it. Mm -hmm. You're done for. <laughs> you're, 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 you're already kind of hoovered into all of the, you know, all the, the people in your life, all the, 
things or the phenomena of the outer world. And so that's a precious time. It's a, it's a liminal time between, you know, between uh, night and day. It's, it's that transition from between dream and sleep. And, and of course, um, uh, you know, it's called the loaming hour and the, the, mm. the, in the old um, uh, uh, British poets. And, and so that's, that's the time for communion. And, and if you give that away, you, you're kind of selling your soul in a way. And, and we all sell our soul. I mean, I know yogis, you know, uh, I have colleagues, who, you know, they sell their soul to the, the, the marketplace. And, yeah, and, the uh, fame machine. Totally. And I'm, mm-hmm. I'm aware of that myself, given just, you know, the, the little bit of, um, of uh, notoriety and, and, and yeah. whatever. It's like, you know, it's the, you have to really carefully, it's like protecting a child, really. You have to protect the, I mean, call it the soul, call it the anima, call it the, the Buddha nature, or call it just your own, you know, heart space. It's, you have to carefully protect that. And then really, then you have to nourish it. And so that's why that morning, that's so important, that, that window of time. So if you're beginning, it might be five minutes, you set your little you know, your little cricket chimer or your little <laughs> or your little Om Santi clock and do your little ding ding and then just do five you know, and then the next day, you know, you, you build up and you do ten and then sooner or later you're like, Oh my god, you know, I'm at the five minute mark and I can't leave this right now. Mm-hmm. This communion is something that's it's calling me. It's really calling me to stay here. And, and if, if you don't feel the call, then, then, then it'll be kind of rote. It'll be just like, oh, yeah, I'm doing five minutes because mindfulness movement is so big now. And everybody says it's good for me, you know. And then, and then you know, you, 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 you have your, your Kellogg special K and you're reading it on the back of the cereal box, how good mindfulness is. And, and until you get to the point where there's that inner calling, you know, and Roki, he, 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 he talked about that as that inner voice. And, and then once you hear that, then you start listening. That's very powerful. And then you're like, wow, 20 minutes will just can, can, can feel like, like three minutes. And, and so uh, I, I, you can't teach, at least I can't teach exactly how to listen to that voice. Mm-hmm. You can really teach another to do that. You can just, you know, um, leave some little breadcrumbs along the trail um, for them to, you know, maybe to follow. And meaning like they, they have to be inspired to move in the direction of that relationship. Is that kind of the idea? And you can't cultivate that inspiration, you know, um, yourself or I think as a so. teacher, I mean, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. It can't, I mean, it can't really be taught. It's like, mm-hmm. Some people will go through this entire life and they'll never do, you know, they'll never have a pl- time and place of inner communion. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, they're in the world of material and they're worried about their checkbook and they're worried about, you know, their car payment and, you know, getting their kids off to school and, and paying for college, etc. And And that's, you know, that's, that's the world we live in. But, but those of us who are interested in this, you know, healing the fundamental split, back to where we started, you know, and, and this idea of yoking and, and being in relationship, which is kind of really what it is. It's like being in relationship with that, that, you know, I, I don't know the words you would like, the soul of that, that, that inner voice or that, the child within is, it's like, then, then it takes time and it takes support from others, good teachers, a good therapist, a really kind friend to help support us there. Um, and there's 108 reasons why we get pulled out of that inner relationship to attend to the world around us. Yeah. Some, some people in this lifetime, they, they never touch it. But those of us who do touch it, that's when we start listening. And then, um, and, and that listening, it kind of brings us closer and closer and closer, you know, in. Yeah. So when we're, when we're, you know, moving inward to, to begin to cultivate that relationship with that inner voice or the anima, as you're saying, um, 
what is the role of emptiness in that? Because, you know, you mentioned, obviously you um, have uh, a long ex or have had much experience in the Buddhist tradition and you're, um, I think you would, do you consider yourself a Zen practitioner? I do. Yeah. Okay. So Zen tradition has had a, you know, powerful impact on your teaching and on your, um, on your approach to these topics and emptiness is a word that you use a lot. And, and I know this is a very popular Buddhist term and shunyata, and we see this, you know, across the Eastern traditions, but, you know, sometimes it's kind of resisted. Um, I feel like uh, in my, at least in conversations that I've had, because it gets sort of contrasted with fullness and, you know, fullness seems more like a better term or a better sort of um, goal <laughs> or, uh, of practice. So how should we understand the role of emptiness in, in the practice of, of moving inward? Mm. Well, you know, language, of course, is tricky. It's hard to yeah. navigate, you know, it's a little bit like the, giant slalom competitors starting up in South Korea here in the Winter Olympics. Like it's hard to <laughs> navigate this slope. And, and yet really, I think the whole idea of emptiness is the open heartedness and the open, the open mindedness. You mm. know? Ah, what's arising now? So if I'm sitting here on a Tuesday morning and you know, I'm really worried about my day, that's what's arising right now. Or I'm thinking about, you know, my, my, my father who's, who's in his last lap around the track, who's, who's, who's going through the dying process now. I'm thinking of him and, or I'm, um, or I'm just feeling my breath or um, I am uh, remembering when I was third grade in third grade on the playground. And, and so we, w whatever's arising, that's where we are. And so then we really are in the nowness. So the emptiness is basically a portal mm. into the nowness. And mm. The nowness, you know, the immediacy of the now is where it's at. And, and then the immediacy of the now has to have a quality of intimacy not like lovey-dovey intimacy, although it could be that, but, but really just that sense of full presence, like, ah, I feel my breath, I feel my fear, I feel my trepidation, I, fear, I feel the longing. So then it's like the intimacy, the immediacy brings us into the now. And then there's, there's space for that to, to occur. And so I think the emptiness of the form business that really just brings us into, you know, um, the, the, the arising of, 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 of where I am today. And, and it's hard to land there. Yeah. It's, it's hard to have the, you know, the discipline really um, to, to, to the staying power to, to stay there. And I think people kind of forget these days that yoga involves discipline. You know? yeah. It's kind of a rare commodity. <laughs> Um, no. and, and that discipline in the subtle body is the capacity to remain with the now, the ever-changing now, mm. with, with an open heart and, and an open mind. Yeah. I like that you said um, that you remarked how intimacy isn't always a kind of lovey-dovey or, um, you know, cuddly experience. Um, and and then what you're saying regarding discipline, because it seems it seems that just as you say, you know, people are seeking out yoga as this sort of something that's going to automatically make them feel better, and so they're chasing this experience of the now on condition that it you know provides a feeling of satisfaction of some kind. So, do you have any remarks on that? On on just on what we're saying on on being intimate with what perhaps you know from a certain vantage point is unpleasant and then how how does that contribute to this process of awakening or however we want to think about it this process of of hearing the inner voice mm. i think many of us use yoga as a sedative yeah i'd be surprised if there are people who got really into this practice at some point in, along their path, we're not using it to sedate themselves. And so there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but, you know, Jung 
Carl Jung was cautious about doing a lot of tapas because it's sedative effect. Mm -hmm. Because he wanted to, to really look at his dreams and, and, and understand the architecture of the soul journey, meaning, you know, all the, all the shadows and the light that are uh, held inside. And so um, when, we, when, we, when we basically stop, you know, using yoga to kind of, you know, whack ourselves over the head and <laughs> sedate ourselves, you know, basically that's kind of like power yoga, which I did yeah. for 15, 18 years. You um, did? Oh, yeah. I didn't know that. In the Shtanga Vinyasa. Uh, yeah. Sure. Danga Vinyasa, very powerful tapas. You know, where really, really after practice, it was like, oh, I was so sore, I could hardly walk, and you know, it was like, it was like, it was just blitzed out. You know, like for hours, uh, where I have to take a nap in the afternoon. I was just so hammered. You know, so then, really, when we're not using it as a sedative, then, um, th then, then the intention is to be with different states of. Of, 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 of feeling and awareness and, and, and being with states of difficulty or you, as you suggest, the unpleasant, basically the painful or the bitter, uh, bittersweet is, is really valuable. I think at some point, I, I'm not sure anybody can really evolve in this path without this. At some point we have to be able to really be with our pain, mm -hmm. the, pain the pain body. And, and I'm not just saying, you know, pain in the lower back, the pain in my shoulder, the, 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 really the heart pain. And that's, that's when our practice starts to really mature. And we're like, okay, this too, this too, like, oh, you know, it's painful to see my child, you know, slip through my fingers and go out into the world. And, and he never speaks to me on the phone anymore. And, you know, I'm losing him. And the pain of a relationship that's falling apart or the pain of, you know, of, of, of realizing that my, my body is kind of falling apart. And so then we, we just, we, when we, we can allow for that sorrow, it really deepens the heart chakra. Mm. So many yogis, they're, they're drawn to the idea of the shanti or the sedative or the, the sweetness, you know, the kind of bliss body. But it, it, within the body of bliss is the body of sorrow. Mm. And of course, the Christ consciousness, you know, the whole thing about the suffering, you know, the, the, the suffering, of course, is, is, is an integral part of joy. There's, there's, really, there's not joy without the suffering part. Um, wow. Yeah, I love, I love the way you put that within the body of bliss is the body of sorrow. I think that's so, such a beautiful way to put it. And, and yeah, it sort of reminds me of um, something someone else said once that Ananda is not this kind of, you know, like roller coaster bliss. Uh, if, if bliss is a roller, if, if roller coasters are blissful for people, I guess they would be scary for other people. Um, but uh, this idea that, you know, Ananda, when it is um, actualized or realized, is sort of this bliss that persists even within the context of, of, um, quote unquote, pleasant and unpleasant, painful and joyful on the surface of life experiences. So that that's a really I like that sort of uh, couched with this idea that within the body of bliss is the body of sorrow. That's really beautiful. Mm. So um, what is I I, I just want to ask this question because I, I don't think I've asked this question on the podcast before, and um, and I think Zen Cohen is that how you pronounce it? Cohen, not Cone. Koan. Koan. I just think they're so cool. Can you talk a little bit about what a Zen koan is and, um, and maybe give an example or two? Well, the, the basically, a Zen koan is a, is a portal. It's a doorway or a portal into working with the psychic interior, um, particularly the part of our psyche that, that craves. Mm. And of course, you know, the, really, we could say the primary aim of yoga at some point is working with craving mind. And the Buddha taught that really, that of all the poisons or all the obstacles to, you know, enlightenment or progression on the path, that craving kind of lies at, at sort of, the, you know, at the, at, the, um, at the base of it all. And so when we start doing koan work, you know, we, 
inevitably we're, we're trying to get it. We're trying to like figure it out. We're, 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 there's a part of our psyche that's trying to grasp it. And then, you know, inevitably in the koan work, it's not possible to grasp. Yeah. You know, like the koan, you know, what's the sound of one hand? Some people say it's the sound of one hand clapping, but uh, I think uh, traditionally it's just the sound of one hand. So, you know, what's the sound of one hand? And so then you can't like suss that out. You can't say, oh, you know, I figured this out. <laughs> it, it's just not possible. And of course, when we're talking about the space of the, you know, Satchitananda or, you know, the Tibetans call it, you know, like the unconditional awareness or the naked awareness or the pure awareness, however you describe that, it, 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 um, it's not accessible through the interpretive lens at all. You can't like, you can't figure it out. You can't, it, it, it's, it's outside of construction. Yeah. So the koans are constructed to kind of deconstruct the mind's capacity to even get and that's that in of itself is a good 10 year project to realize oh my god i really can't get this and some people you know have moments of just powerful heart openings or they have really powerful moments where um they 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 they, 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 they i think they re realize this but for many of us you know um it's 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 a it's a journey to really say wow i can't grasp this and i'm really at peace with that i really i'm really okay with that and um, um there's a letting go of part of the psychic the, the kind of fabric of the psychic interior you know there's a, there's a breakthrough of that um and that opens us up to really starts opening us up to everything mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I like, I love what you're saying because it's sort of a reminder of um, that this process isn't about get it, getting it, as you're saying, it's about gripping hold of some kind of, you know, conceptual substance that will, that will finally um, redeem us. It isn't about, you know, arriving at the right answer uh, in, and, 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 um, and I love it because it's sort of a practice of, uh, approaching the non-conceptual that so much of the tradition is talking about. You know, we hear of, you know, the Purusha is beyond concepts and, and Brahman, the Atman is, is, is beyond concepts. There's no categories that can, that can, um, that can, that can capture it. And, and so this is really, the Zen coin seems to be this practice of, of moving in that direction rather than just sort of describing it with you know philosophy or whatnot this this mode or domain of the non-conceptual mm. so ts um we're we, this has been a lovely conversation and i want to move now to um might be the uh last topic that we'll cover or maybe one of the last ones um which is you know how yoga connects to death um, and you offer two talks that I found on your SoundCloud, um, where you're talking about the Kata Upanishad and um, the deity of death, Yama. Mm. And so I wish I just wanted to maybe um, invite you to reflect on how yoga connects to death or how you see yoga as being a, a science of death. Mm. Yeah, well, of course, we could say that, you know, the sister science of yoga is Ayurveda, Mm -hmm. Ayur, of course, means life, and Veda is the study of, or the, in that case, the you know the the prolonging of longevity, the prolonging of life. And so, if Ayurveda is the study of life, then then yoga is really the science of death, and 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 Shavasana, of course, being the, you know, in a sense, the um, the ultimate pose, and, um, mm. and really, of course, you know, it's it's so hard to let go. I mean, yoga is all about letting go. Um, it's all about letting go. And, and, and the question is, you know, can we let go before we let go? Can we let go before we die? And, um, and that's very, very difficult because my father is, is in his dying um, phase right now. He's in the last really few weeks or months. We don't know of his life. And, and it's a powerful thing to witness death firsthand. Yeah. And, um, uh, and so when we do, when, we, when we're able to, in a sense, 
kind of, of course, let um, you know, let go. There's there's this sense of um, of uh, uh, really, in a sense, um, uh, it's it's that letting go of all all that we think we we sh- who we should be, who we think we should be, and also um, our identifications of who we are. So. Um, um, really, as 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 the, in the dying process, the Tibetans, of course, so they celebrate this as the birth, and that's why the Parinirvana, or you know, the Great Death, the, um, the is it, it, it's really kind of like a um, a becoming, and um, uh, so I just think for each of us day to day, we we kind of it's a preparatory work to 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 let go, and the last. 20 years of life, you know, 10 years or five years, um, there's, there, the, can, we, can we prepare ourselves? Can we ready ourselves for um, the, the, great, the great letting go? And, um, and so that's, that's, of course, non-clinging, another way of describing non-clinging. In our, uh, and so in so many ways, we, we cling to our, um, our, our ideas, we cling to people, we cling to ideas, we cling to um, what we own, uh, we cling to who we think we are. And so there's a great shedding, you know, there's a real great shedding that goes on layer by layer, back to the subtle body, layer by layer, and uh, um, a psychic shedding. And so it's not that if you shed before you finally, you know, slough off your your body, you know, if you're able to kind of shed all those, you know, the neuroses and the obsessiveness and compulsiveness, and then, um, um, then, 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 then we kind of already are, are, are boundless. We are, are already kind of in, 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 a, in, in, an, in an open space. So um, we could say that yoga is really a preparation for, um, for, for, for dying. Uh, in a really positive way, in a really powerful way. Mm. Do you think that the some of the modes of doing yoga that we're seeing are, you know, in terms of the the asana practice that is be, that is the most in vogue, um, is maybe perhaps a, a kind of clinging to the body, clinging to you know, flexibility, clinging to the appearance of certain postures. Um, and, you know, is, do you think that's, this is a form of, of um, maybe not a, a form of yoga that is attuned to what you're talking about? I think so. I think, you know, many do yoga as a self-improvement project. Mm-hmm. And so um, that's a big industry, you know, <laughs> they're, um, People spend thousands of dollars on self-improvement, and that all is good. Um, I've worked that way many, many years in my own, my own path. And then there's a point at which we kind of arrive at another door, another gate, and this is more subtle body or, or you know, um, more uh, sophisticated in a way. Is like, okay, now it's not about improving myself. It's beginning to kind of shed who I think, who I think I am or who I think I should be. Yeah. Sometimes it's, oh, I need to be this amazing male yogi or, oh, I need to be enlightened or, oh, I need to be, you know, um, I need to be this or I need to be that. And so when we start shedding, um, that's, that's when we start really feeling free and we didn't realize how we've been in the grip or the snare of these identifications for many, many years. And, um, and so, well, yeah, it's kind of, it's about, about self, you know, we want to keep our bodies healthy and, and mindful and mindfulness to keep our, our, um, our uh, spirit open. But then there's a place at which, hmm, then we start letting go. Mm-hmm. And don't wait too late, you know, <laughs> don't wait until you're on the last lap around the track because it takes a long time. We're talking a good 10, 20 year project um, to do the shedding. So, um, you know, there's a beautiful little Zen koan, you know, cicada shell, little did I know it was my life. Mm. Cicada shell, little did I know it was my life. And we realize that our sh- we kind of have this shell, this outer 
thing that we take carry around with us. It's kind of like our protective armoring and it's kind of like our identity, even if it's a, even if it's a yoga identity. And then, and then you're like, wow, what's it like to drop the cicada shell, you know? And can you, and when we drop the cicada shell, then there's this metamorphosis. There's, there's something else that emerges and, um, and that's, wow, that's, um, that's a beautiful thing. Mm. So I thought it was interesting that you also said, you know, letting go of, you know, attachments uh, to certain expressions or certain appearances of the body, letting go of certain ideas we have about ourselves. You also said letting go of the need to be enlightened. So I thought that was sort of interesting. And um, so in what way is do you see sort of ideas about enlightenment being a part of this kind of cicada shell? This, even the mention of enlightenment is possibly a huge, you know, sand trap <laughs> <laughs> that, um, that people get stuck in. And, mm -hmm. uh, and then we have, you know, we have all kinds of ideas about what it is. Yeah. What it should look like or who, you know, who, you know, who, who has it. Yeah, right. Yeah. You know? And so, you know, um, there's all kinds of projections uh, that we make around that. And then there's a point at which, wow, you know, um, you know, if you read the Diamond Sutra, one of the great Mahayana texts, uh, along with the Heart Sutra, in the wisdom development in the Buddha's training, the the the, the Buddha is very clear that it's you know that I'm that I'm not enlightened. I, that it's not, you know, uh, that is um, that there there's no mark, there's nothing there that says this is it. But our minds are always wanting to grasp onto that, and if we could grasp it, then we'd build a website around it and we you know sell it for 99.99 a month you know and, you know but we're talking about something that's inconceivable mm -hmm. um that's that's p p totally beyond grasp and um and that's boundless in that sense and so so um then uh and then what are we left with well often because we're left with our grasping mind and, and our projections about, you know, what, what enlightenment should be or would look like. Uh, and then eventually, uh, we always kind of feel less than. So if you're on the sitting cushion, and those of us who practice this regularly, we're like, oh, I'm not there. How can this be enlightenment? Because I got a pain in my shoulder or I'm getting distracted, you know, by, um, by, my, uh, by my chatter. And then, oh, no, this isn't it. This isn't it. This isn't it. So... Um, then, then we're back in the, the duel. We're back in the fundamental split again. So mm -hmm. um, it's, it's good to let go of, of ideas of, uh, at all together about what, what enlightenment might be. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Well, and a lot of food for thought here. It's been such a pleasure talking to you, Tias. Um, mm -hmm. Is there anything that you, any closing, you know, thoughts that you have based on what we've been talking about um, or anything else you want to bring up? Um, I think last thing is just sleep really deeply. <laughs> Good <laughs> advice. Sleep. I need to remember to do that all the time. Yeah. Sleep, one of the greatest medicines and, uh, and that heals, heals the subtle body. Uh, um, and then replicate positions uh, or moments in your life that, that are like sleep. Um, mm. and then start to kind of, you know, find that liminal space between waking and sleeping and spend as much time there as possible. Yeah, that's great advice. What a great, and everybody go take a nap. <laughs> um, so Tias, you know, uh, is there anything you want to share in terms of what you're doing or do you have any workshops or trainings coming up that you want to share with our audience or ways people can connect with you? Sure. Well, of course, I'm based here in Santa Fe, New Mexico, where I've lived for 30 years. And my wife and I built a retreat center 15 minutes outside of the downtown area. And um, really, you know, uh, uh, this year, you know, I have um, uh, 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 lots of events that really focus all around the subtle body and um, particularly silent retreats. We do silent retreats here on our property where there's lots of meditation and 
and yoga combined. And, uh, and then um, one of my favorite courses is the one where uh, people learn how to do a home practice. Mm. It's called Art of Self-Practice. Uh, where uh, people learn really just ingrain inside of themselves. Oh, I can do home practice. Um, and that's one of your closest, will become one of your closest friends is having uh, uh, a self-practice that you do every day. Absolutely. Wonderful. And when is that taking place, the art of self-practice? That's in May of this year. Okay. And that's taking, you're teaching that out of Santa Fe? Yes. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, it's been such a pleasure chatting with you, Tias, and um, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Mm. Thank you, Jacob. Be well.